from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Monica Norton. I'm the deputy local editor for the Washington Post, a charter sponsor of this event. This is the 15th year that the Library of Congress has hosted this event. I have the great pleasure of introducing David Marinus, the author of Once in a Great City, a Detroit Story. Mr. Marinus is an associate editor of the Washington Post. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner for his coverage of Bill Clinton during the 1992 presidential election. He shared in another Pulitzer in 2008 for the coverage of the Virginia Tech shootings, and he's a three-time finalist for the award. He's also the author of six best-selling books, including Clemente, The Passion and Grace of Baseball's Last Hero, Barack Obama, The Story, and When Pride Still Mattered, A Life of Vince Lombardi. He has been called a contemporary historian and one of the greatest chroniclers of sociological and political issues. His latest book is squarely in that vein. Once in a Great City chronicles nearly two years in the early 1960s when life in Detroit appeared to be ascendant. It begins in 1963 when the American auto industry had its best year and a little place called Motown had everyone dancing in the streets. But even then, the city was on the precipice of collapse and it's still working to recover from it. Once in a Great City does not sugarcoat the stumbles and failures that led to Detroit's decline. In fact, Mr. Marinus writes that it was the failure to address the economic and racial disparities that ultimately resulted in the city's failures. The book has been called wistful, even melancholy at points, but it should also be viewed as a letter to a lost but not forgotten love. The past isn't romanticized, but it is remembered for the love that it imbued in its native son. And if the book doesn't convince you of that, wander over to Mr. Marinus's website. He's created a lovely Spotify list of some of Motown's greatest hits. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the author of Once in a Great City, David Marinus. Thank you, Monica. You'd probably be all happier if we just listened to some Motown tunes, but you got to listen to me. Um, and thank you all for either eating early or skipping dinner or eating late, uh, this little dinner hour presentation. I, uh, this is my 11th book, and it's the one that came to me in the oddest way, I would say. It was February of 2011. I was in New York City in a bar watching the Super Bowl with the cast of Lombardi. Uh, a play that was being performed there based on one of my books. And at halftime, I looked, I was not paying too much attention to anything at halftime, but I looked up at the screen and saw a, a, a sign, a freeway that said Detroit. And that caught my attention. And I started watching. And I saw the Diego Rivera mural, Detroit Industry one of the great iconic murals of the world. I saw the Joe Louis Fist. I saw Woodward Avenue. And then this hypnotic beat came on and a black Chrysler driving through the streets past the people of Detroit. And then I realized it was Eminem in the car and it was his music. And he gets out at the Fox Theater and walks under the marquee and down the aisle in the dark lit Fox Theater and there's a beautiful gospel choir on stage rising in song and Eminem turns and says, this is the Motor City, this is what we do. Now that was a commercial and my wife, uh, smartly, although she, she, she doesn't like me to tell this story and claims part of it's apocryphal, but it's not. Anyway, she basically called me uh, crazy for falling for this. Detroit, you know, it was a commercial. It was just selling cars. Um, Detroit was a mess. What was I tearing up for? Why did it get me like that? And I started to think about that and realized that uh, it was primordial. I was born in Detroit. I lived there for the first six and a half years of my life. Uh, my father was a newspaper man at the old defunct, now defunct, long defunct Detroit Times. I learned to read in an integrated 
elementary school, Winterhalter uh, School. And that touched me at some deep level when I saw that commercial. Now, I didn't think that I wanted to buy a Chrysler, <laughs> but I did want to write about Detroit. And I started thinking about how I could do that. I'm not an economics writer. I knew Detroit was in many ways collapsing and had, and that that's a very important American story. It's not what I do. I'm a nonfiction narrative writer. I'm interested in sociology, in why places are shaped the way they are, in the people that shape them, and in history, and in, in, in infusing the present into the past. So I started thinking about all that Detroit gave America. And that was my first motivation. Now, all my books, with a couple of exceptions of, of books that were turned out because of series I'd written for the Washington Post, but the books that I've invested in, they all have to have some obsession for me and some combination thread of themes that I'm interested in a dramatic arc of the story. So I started thinking about how could I approach this story and really convey to this country what Detroit means and what it meant. And I went back into time and found a moment. This book is about 18 months from October of 1962 to May of 1964. An incredible period of time in Detroit, luminescent, when Motown was booming, Barry Gordy and his sisters, who were under-recognized in history, his four sisters who helped him all along the way, um, were just starting to reach the peak. It was before the Supremes really had made it, or the Temptations, but the first Motortown Review left Detroit in October of 1962, carrying in one bus Little Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Mary Wells, Marvin Gaye, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, and the Temptations and Supremes as backup singers. They left Detroit, and their first stop was Washington, D.C., here at the Howard Theater. At the very same week, the Detroit Auto Show was unveiling the 1963 cars that would sell more than any cars in history to that point in Detroit. Cars and music, that's typical of me, uh, were two of the five elements that I was interested in. Another was labor. Walter Ruther and the UAW were at their peak. And not just in terms of helping lift the working class, the black and white working class into the middle class in Detroit first, in such an important way for all human beings in the world and this country out of Detroit, but also on another level. The, the UAW was the most progressive union in that period, and Walter Ruther and his brothers and the leadership of the UAW were essentially helping to fund the civil rights movement in the South in that incredibly important moment. Um, when Martin Luther King was in jail in Birmingham, it was the UAW that helped send the money, the cash, down to get those people out of jail. They spent money at the uh, March to Washington. Um, they were really invested in the lifting up of all people. So it wasn't just uh, sort of trying to get the best salaries for auto workers, but really trying to make a larger social movement. That was coming out of Detroit. So you had civil rights, labor, the middle class, Motown, music, and cars. The Mustang, the sort of symbol of the 60s and independent spirit and uh, you know, the, the, the liberated America that was coming right then was being conceived during this, these 18 months. All of these incredible events um, came out of Detroit, and I really wanted to honor that. And I spent, my wife and I spent uh, much time in Detroit over the course of three years, 
There were moments when I thought I was maybe the only person in the city. Uh, we, we would stay at a wonderful old bed and breakfast called the Inn on Ferry Street, a block from the Detroit Institute of Arts where that great Diego Rivera mural is along with world-class art. Uh, art that was just at that moment being threatened by the possibility of some of it being sold. I had a sense it wouldn't happen and it hasn't, thank goodness, but uh, it's one of the great art museums in the world. We were a block away, a block away from the Walter Ruther Library with one of the, the greatest labor archive in the world. Um, and we'd go there and sometimes when we'd cross Woodward Avenue, I felt, as I wrote in the book, I felt like I could sit down in the middle of the street and read War and Peace and not get hit by a car. Um, it was that empty at times. Now this was starting two and a half years ago to the time when I finished writing the book eight months ago. Even in the last eight months, there's been this incredible revival. I can't wait to get back there. And that area has, is booming now in a, in, a, in a wonderful way. There is, in some sense, a renaissance in Detroit. But it's a, it's a limited renaissance uh, in the sense that Detroit is one of the biggest geographic cities in the country. It's 28 miles across. And one of the beauties of that city in its heyday was that people could live in single family homes. And so many of those people were working class. And so many of those homes are gone or abandoned, leveled. I drove to where the, the two houses that I spent my first six years in, one is gone, the other is abandoned on Dexter Avenue in Cortland. So how do you bring that back? That's a question. You can, you can have this great creativity. People, I mean, I tell anyone who's age 22 to 35, go to Detroit. You can invent yourself there. Um, there's this the, the, the sort of the central tension of my book and what I see actually in all of life, but in Detroit in the most profound way, is creation and creativity decay and destruction. That's what life is. There's always that combat between those two elements. And Detroit just had that at a deeper level. And right now, it's the decay and destruction reached a level where creativity and creation can happen again. So it is a great place for young people to go. Techies or musicians, foodies, all kinds of artists. Uh, it's one of those places where you can invent yourself again. But what do you, but it, can you call it a renaissance until the rest of that Detroit is brought back? I'm not sure that that can happen. Now when people talk about what happened Detroit, to Detroit, there's a common tendency to blame it, the demise of Detroit, on three conditions. One was the riots or rebellion in 1967. A second is later, corruption, municipal corruption, and the third is uh, the labor unions and the large pensions. I'm not saying that in one degree or another those weren't factors somewhat, but that's not the story. Detroit's, Detroit was dying in 1963 when I focused on the city. It was luminescent. It had all of these things shining bright, but it was also a luminescence that reflected its time. It was structural, and it had to do with sort of a perfect storm of four things. One was the racial problems of Detroit that, that, went on, that were going on for decades, going back to 1943, when the largest race riot in American history took place in Detroit. Um, when there was a lot of tension over, this was when Detroit was the arsenal of democracy. It was building all of the munitions that fought World War II, right there. It was bringing in, flooding in people from Appalachia and from the rural south, black and white. And enormous tensions were building and they exploded in 1943 and Detroit never really quite got past that. So by 1963, the racial tensions played out in, in problems having to do mostly with housing. Detroit never resolved it. 
What it did do was urban renewal, which most of the African Americans in Detroit called Negro removal. It destroyed very important communities that could never quite be replaced. So the housing problems, the urban renewal, the racial tension, were all building in this one city, as they are all over the country, but it was just more intense there. And at the same time, you had this structural problem of it being essentially a one-company town, the auto industry. And by 1963, the auto industry was expanding all over the country. It was leaving Detroit. The, the, the uh, big three were sort of abandoning the city in so many different ways, much to their regret decades later, too late. Um, so all of that was combining, and you could see it in 1963. Right at the moment, the heart of my book, some sociologists at Wayne State University put out a report that essentially predicted everything that would happen later. That so-called, quote unquote, productive people were leaving the city, leaving it to only those who had to fend for themselves. That the population then, it was the fifth largest city in the country, 1.7 million would be losing 500,000 people every decade, exactly what has happened. It was not stopped. So you had this decay and destruction and creation and creativity going on at the same time during the period of my book. Um, I tell stories through character. And Detroit in this period had some of the great characters I could ever want to write about. Uh, Barry Gordy being one, the creator of Motown. Uh, the chairman, as he called himself. He got that name because when he was growing up, his family, which had come up from the south and was a very sort of business-oriented family, but they lived in a rough part of Detroit, and there were rats running around in their kitchen at night. And little Barry Gordy was afraid of rats. I really identified with that story because I, my first memories of Detroit are looking out the back window and seeing rats screwing around in our garage. So I'm always looking for ways to identify with my characters. When I wrote the book about Roberto Clemente, I loved him in so many different ways, but one of the main ways that I connected to him was that he was called a hypochondriac. Well, I'm dying every day. I'm, a, I'm the ultimate hypochondriac. So, you know, here's this beautiful ball player, uh, and I could find some way to connect with him right away because of that. Well, Barry Gordy and I connected over our fear of rats. So they called him the chairman because when he was a little boy, he'd climb up on a chair and he'd hide from the rats, and all of his sisters would make fair, fun of him and call him little chairman. Uh, he, you know, he was, he was a businessman in every sense of the word, but he also had a brilliant sensibility about talent. And imagine a city where all of those people that I had mentioned grew up within a few blocks of one another, plus Aretha Franklin, who was not Motown, but was, grew up there a couple of blocks from Smokey Robinson. Now, why did it happen there? Why does creativity happen? That's one of the things I'm always fascinated by when I'm studying history. Well, it turns out as I studied more about Detroit, I came to realize that it, it, part, part of it was just magic. It always is. Part of it was Barry Gordy's uh, skills. But some of it was because of what human beings did for each other. And there are two key things. As I said, Detroit was a vast city, 28 square miles, which meant 28 miles, which meant that most people did have single family homes. What can you do in a single family home much easier than in a lot of major urban centers where you're going up five floors without an elevator? You can get a piano. How do you get a piano? Well, Detroit had one of the great music companies in the world, Grinnell Brothers Pianos, which would sell pianos uh, at very good prices to everybody, black and white. So almost every musician that I talked to for this book talked about the piano in their home. Smokey Robinson had one, playing it when he was a little boy. Aretha started playing when she was two. Uh, all, of the, all of the characters in, the, in, in Motown talked about their pianos and about Grinnell Brothers' music. The other key factor was music teachers. 
Every single musician I talked to remembered their elementary school music teacher, their, middle, their junior high teacher, their senior high teacher, and the music was in the schools everywhere. There was a commitment to music. It wasn't by accident. These people learned music. They loved music. They were singing all day on the streets in school. Martha Reeves, when I interviewed her, told me about her, her high school music teacher who was a, a, a classical musician. And he wanted her to sing opera. And she did. And in the middle of my interview, I have it on tape. I'll never lose it. She breaks into an aria. Uh, it was part of that culture. And, you know, I've taken this a little bit from a book I wrote about Vince Lombardi, a Jesuit who would talk about freedom through discipline. That it's only when you learn something, the fundamentals of something, that you can actually explore and have the freedom to create. And I think there was some of that in Detroit, where these musicians had learned the fundamentals of music, and then they created this unforgettable soundtrack of my generation's life, and I think it's still as popular today in many ways as it was when I was uh, coming up in the 60s. That's what the creativity came from in Detroit, from pianos and music teachers and the skill of, of uh, Barry Gordy, uh, all together to combine this moment of, of brilliance. Now, when I was talking about civil rights, one of the tent poles of my book uh, happened on June 23rd, 1963, right in the middle of my book. This was after Birmingham, after Medgar Evers had been assassinated in Mississippi. Uh, the preacher, C. L., Reverend C.L. Franklin, the father of Aretha, this incredibly idiosyncratic, colorful, somewhat a uh, corrupt but brilliant preacher who had, he was what they called a circuit flyer preacher. He was so popular in the late 1950s that he would fly off with his three daughters and this crew of, of other singers and people and, and hold these revivals these in, in big cities in the South. 10,000 people would come to hear Reverend Franklin preach. They knew, they knew all of his his major sermons because they were recorded by chess records. Um, so they'd shout out like it, was, like it was Motown 10 years later, they'd shout out, sing uh, the eagle stirreth its nest. And he, he wanted to give another sermon, but he'd do what the people wanted, he'd, he'd give this sermon. And he started to, to preach in a way where one, one scholar who I read about describing uh, Franklin said that he would start and in the middle of his preaching, he'd start humming. And then he'd start preaching at the pitch of his hum. And, and it was a beautiful, evocative, haunting uh, sort of preaching that you can see echoed again in the singing of his daughter in so many ways. The pitch of her hum is unlike any other. But Reverend C.L. Franklin in 1963 was trying to get into civil rights. He'd, he'd known Martin Luther King um, from the South from many, many years ago. And they both had a mutual friend in Mahalia Jackson. Mahalia called Reverend Franklin and said, you've got to help the Southern movement. He, he was not, Franklin was not really part of the civil rights movement in Detroit until then. He was considered too sort of provocative for most of the Black Baptist Ministerial Alliance in the city and many of the civil rights leaders, um, but he had the biggest following in town. So he decided to organize a rally. It became known as the Walk to Freedom. He would bring Martin Luther King to Detroit. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Many of the young uh, politicians in town really didn't trust Franklin. They thought it would be a disaster. They tried to throw him out of leading this, this rally. It didn't work, it kept going. And on the day of the rally, 150,000 people showed up. People who had never marched before. And they walked all the length from Wayne State University down to Cobo Hall, down Woodward Avenue, 150,000 strong. 
when Martin Luther King was greeted at the airport, it was by a progressive police chief, George Edwards, who had been hired by the liberal Kennedy acolyte mayor of Detroit, Jerome Cavanaugh, both of whom came into office on the strength of the heavy African-American vote. They were committed to trying to change Detroit from that history that had been lingering for decades. This is right after Birmingham. King lands in Detroit at noon that day, and the first words to him are, you won't find the police dogs here, Reverend King. And they bring him into town. They walk down Woodward Avenue. It's so jostling. Walter Ruther is there marching arm in arm with King, with Reverend Franklin. They get to Cobo Hall. And King delivers the Eye of a Dream speech. This is two months before Washington. Barry Gordy is there recording it. It's not the exact same words that he delivered in Washington, but it's the same, I have a dream. Some of the dream is about Detroit, some of it is about America, some of it is about the South. It started in Detroit. So many things started in Detroit in that sense. The auto industry at that point, starting to move out of town, but also very creative. The, the uh, Mustang is being conceived secretly. Uh, J. Walter Thompson Advertising Company is hired by Ford Motor Company to help figure out this new car and how to sell it. They developed the largest public relations campaign at that point in American history for the Mustang, uh, sort of conceiving it in a, a, a secret rooms in the Buell building downtown that they called the tomb, where only a few people knew what was really going on, and then in private office, uh, private plant out in, in Dearborn, where, again, only a few people know what was going. The Mustang was sort of conceived as something new. It wasn't really. The chassis was a Ford Falcon. Um, Every part in it came from somewhere else, but it had this different look, a longer hood, and it appealed to the sex appeal of the 60s. It was a perfect moment for it. Conceived in 63, built, coming out right near the end of my book, unveiled at the World's Fair in New York in 1964. And right after that, in May of 1964, Lyndon Johnson, who was supposed to come to Detroit for the Detroit Auto Show in 1962, but didn't make it because of some small development called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, he finally gets to Detroit in May of 64, right after the Mustang has, has been unveiled, when everything seems to be, as I said, luminescent in Detroit. He calls Detroit he lands it at the airport. Henry Ford II endorses him for president, the first time that's ever happened, a Republican Ford endorsing a Democrat. Everything seems to be moving along. George Romney, the governor, is there, a man quite unlike his son, by the way, who during the, those housing battles of that era actually marched in the streets of, of Gross Point, uh, trying to change the, the housing of Gross Point, where, which had the Gross Point point system for decades. The most invidious form of housing discrimination you can imagine, where a small cabal of real estate people and the powers of Gross Point would literally rank points for who could move in there. And if you were African American or Mexican, Forget it. If you were from uh, Eastern Europe or Italy, much more difficult. A couple of mobsters actually made it in. Um, but they were all listed by points. And George Romney marched against that and spoke out against it. Anyway, he was at the airport to greet LBJ, too, who declares Detroit the herald of hope and then goes to Ann Arbor and delivers 
the Great Society speech. And he talks about the cities of America and about Detroit and about the struggles of urban America and his commitment to trying to change that. That's why this book is wistful, because you see all of these, all of this promise. And then you know what the story, what happens after my book ends. In 19, for so many years before that, the presidential campaigns would start in Detroit. JFK, in 1960, came to Cadillac Square in Detroit to launch his campaign on Labor Day. Walter Ruther at his side. And in that speech, for the first time, he gave a variation of the most famous line of his presidency. It wasn't quite as poetic, but he said, the new frontier is not what I promise I'm going to do for you. The new frontier is what I ask you to do for your country. So in this book, what I'm really trying to say for all of those problems of Detroit, think about what it gave America. We have this tendency to blame Detroit, say, what has it done? Instead, we should all say, what can we do for Detroit? Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions about Detroit or Vince Lombardi or anything you want to talk about. Well, yeah, I was just curious. Um, what advice do you have to people like myself? I'm working on a PhD right now, and I have a, a ton of like information that I want to make consumable for yeah. people that aren't necessarily in, in the academy. Right. What advice do you have uh, for aspiring writers like myself to, to make things mass consumable? <laughs> well, uh, I'll try not to take that phrase as an insult. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. Because, of course, any writer wants to be read. That's the point, right? It should be the point. You want it to be read, understood, enjoyed. You want people to start it and read it to the very end. You want them to get something out of it. So, um, you know, I, I deal with that question quite a bit because I, I also teach at, at Vanderbilt University and I've taught other places. And, and there's, there is a tension between academic writing and the sort of writing that, that I and my friends do. Um, but it's rooted in the same things. I can't write unless I've done the research. So that's, that's number one. I got to know the story deeply. For me, that means so many things. The archival research, going there, which a lot of academics don't do, that's my number one rule. Uh, you know, when I, when I was doing Lombardi, I, I turned to my wife and uttered the immortal loving words, how would you like to move to Green Bay for the winter? Um, <laughs> made it up to her by taking her to Rome and Puerto Rico and <laughs> Vietnam and many other more exotic places. But, but in any case, I, it's hard to teach people how to write, but, but, but what, I, what the writers I respect do is use detail in the means of illuminating something larger. I, I love detail. It, it's everything to me, but only if it adds up to something that takes the reader someplace, makes them feel they're there and understand why things are happening. So I look for character. I look for, I mean, the, the obvious things that you see in any, any form. You know, a movie or books are the same, nonfiction. You want drama, you want character, and you want tension. And they're in everything in life, as I described, that tension between creative creation, creativity, destruction, decay is the tension of this book in so many ways. You can always find those themes of tension. And then, you know, I'm, I'm turning into a writing coach here, I guess, but, but then don't be afraid to unpack it. Don't rush everything into it. Let the story unfold and trust the story. Yes, sir. There have been reports that over the years, um, the Motown producers did not share the profits with 
many of the music, lesser known musicians. I wondered if you looked into that and whether that has been remedied. Yeah, you know, it's not part of the book because it was, it was well, it was sort of part of the book because a lot of the, a lot of the musicians weren't even getting credit. You know, the 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 brilliant uh, funk brothers musicians often weren't even credited on the albums, and some of the arrangers and producers weren't properly credited. Um, so I do mention that, but the actual larger, this book takes place again before everything collapses. So you have Motown at that point is still pretty much a, a crazy happy family. It's before all of the egos and the money and everything else inevitably gets in the way of everything. And Barry Gordy was certainly responsible for some of that. And, and was, it was held against him for a very long time by many of the musicians. Um, so yes, it happened. Um, more, more powerfully than even Motown was what happened to uh, Jesus Rodriguez, Sugar Man, mm. um, who was this brilliant Mexican-American musician in, in Detroit and, and became hugely popular in South Africa of all places. And somebody was completely screwing him, and he was not getting any royalties from everything he was doing. And that's sort of related to, to the, what, the experience at Motown as well. Um, it's, but again, my book is a little before that. Everything collapses after my book. <laughs> you know, it's really, uh, C.L. Franklin uh, gets an armed robbers enter his home and shoot him. He gets into coma for seven years and then dies. Walter Ruther dies in a plane crash with his wife in 1970, um, flying up to what he considered would be the Valhalla of auto workers, this wonderful uh, vacation resort that he was developing up in northern Michigan. Um, Barry Gordy leave, abandons Detroit and goes to Los Angeles. Um, there's a huge fight in my book between LA and Detroit all along, which is symbolic of, of Rust Belt versus Sun Belt. And, I haven't even mentioned it, but the fight was over the 1968 Olympics, which Detroit was the nominee for the US and thought they would get it, and LA tried to undermine that. And uh, there were other factors involved in why Detroit eventually didn't get it, but, but think about, I mean, this is counterfactual history. What if Detroit had staged the 68 Olympics? For better and worse, would the riots have happened in 67? Would the, the, the uh, business community have felt more responsible for, for taking care of their people. Um, this was, 68 was the moment of, of black ex, of expression. You know, the John Carlos and, you know, the, the power salute, Tommy Smith, happened in Mexico City, which did get the Olympics. What if all that had happened in Detroit? What would that have been like? So, and then the Mustang gets fat. You know, it doesn't die, it's still around, but it was never the same again. Um, so many of the things die including uh, and including Motown sort of splits apart in different ways. But the other thing I'm always trying to emphasize is what lasts. And I tell you, my wife and I went to the Howard University, uh, the Howard Theater, I'm sorry, the Howard Theater last year, 51 years after the Motortown Review, 52 years. Martha Reeves was there. Dancing in the streets, that lasts <laughs> forever. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, thank you for all of your wonderful books. First in his class is one of my absolute all-time favorite books. Thank and you. It, I recently noted that Bill Clinton is now the same age that Ronald Reagan was when he became president of the United States. 11 it's kind of freaky. 11 yeah. months younger. Yeah, yeah. And you, as you point out in your book, in 92, he's basically boxed into running for president. If he's going to ever do it, he can't run for governor again. Right. You know, he has trouble right. winning his last re-election. He's not going to serve in the cabinet for a Democratic president. He can't run for the Senate. Um, do you think there's any part of him that wishes that he had spent more of his life striving and less of his life in retirement, and do you think he Absolutely perhaps, not, but go on. Uh, but do you think he perhaps thinks that if he had become president in 2000 or 2008 that he might have been a better president? Maybe that, but I, I, I don't even think he would view it that way. I would think, he thinks he was kind of unlucky that he, he was, pre it's, it's kind of the way people who think about legacy and want to be famous forever are. He wanted to have some huge test like FDR had, and he didn't get it. 
you know. So whether he really, how he would have handled it, who knows. But he feels a little unlucky that he was kind of a bridge, you know, as he said in his last campaign to the new world of the 21st century. Um, you know, so, but in answer to your question, no. He, you know, his probable father died before he was born. I say that, I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but I've never been quite sure who his real dad was. Um, and uh, he had this sensibility from a very early age that he wasn't going to live very long, and he had to move fast. And so he was, no, nothing was going to stop him. Uh, he was the youngest, second youngest governor in American history, the youngest ex-governor in American history. Um, and, uh, you know, he wasn't the youngest president. Uh, Teddy was younger, but, but he, no, he, he, he had to, Partly because he had this need to be famous, partly because he he had he, he wasn't sure how long he would last, so I'm not sure that 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 he would ever think I did it too soon, and maybe uh, maybe he thinks his wife did it too late. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi. It's very hard to talk to someone you admire when you've had time to think about it, <laughs> rather than oh. just getting up and talking. Um, you know, first in his class was terrific. I think Bill Clinton thought that he should have been president in 1987. And I well, think that he, Hillary would have won in 2004 if she had run. Uh, but I d dissected first in his class when we were talking, you were talking about what makes good writing. And what I, what I felt about your book and my understanding of Bill Clinton is that you hit the right balance between inspiration and precision. And you use the word detail, but that's interesting because they always say the devil's in the details. Uh -huh. But I think very often people who are inspired are not precise, and people who are precise are very often not inspired. So it's an unusual combination that I think you bring to. Thank and, you. and it was a memorable book about a memorable person. And I think that was a chance for a sort of democratic Reaganism. You know, the democratic values could have come really high in 92, but Bill Clinton is who he is. The thing, uh, I was listening to uh, They Marched Into Sunlight last night as I was going to sleep. Not that you put oh, me to sleep. Oh, God. No, I would. <laughs> so I'm sort of... <laughs> My so I'm, droning nasal voice. Oh, no, 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 no. 67, uh, you know, there's so much happened. You know, the forest yeah. fire, and then McCain is captured just a few months later. And Jefferson Airplane and the doors, you know, when I was growing up in Leavenworth, Kansas, which is not just a penitentiary, so, you know, yeah. it's, it's also I have some Kansas Leavenworth. friends, I know. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, everyone who becomes a general goes to the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. And also it's where the uh, In Cold Blood murder Yes, were. well, not, not in Leavenworth. It, Lan Lansing State, okay. Lansing State. Um, but, I, but the thing is, I think you've captured two times that were so interesting. For me, it's June of 63 to February 64. June yeah, of 63, Vivian Malone integrates yes. the University of Alabama. Then Patrick Kennedy dies in August of 63, which was such a sad thing. And then, of course, he's killed in November. Then I happened to look up Billboard's number one song years ago, right after Kennedy was shot. It was The Singing Nun in Dominique. And then there was... Ma'am, I don't mean to be rude, but oh, can sorry. you get to your question? Yes. I, no, I, I'm I really just, not trying to I, be rude. No, I, okay. think you've, I think you've hit two critical periods. Well, you know, I think June of 60, June of If I did, it was somewhat by accident. And then I think the 67 period, the summer of love, June yeah, right. to October of Thank 67, you. that those okay. were times where that really America changed and got cool and went through the struggle and you all know, of it happened. I only have two minutes left. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, sir. No, no worries. Uh, I swear to God, I've got questions. So, you know. um, <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mr. Manis. I appreciate it. Um, what's the relationship between Lyndon Johnson and uh, Governor Romney? Uh, outside of the uh, arena, what is uh, Joe, Legis Joe uh, Lewis's legacy, his footprint? Um, Detroit. Detroit. And uh, staying with first in his class for 600. Um, it, it's, it, it's hard to keep a good man down. Do I have down. to answer by asking a question well, like I mean, Jeopardy? You know, or? It, it, I'm struggling enough. This damn Mike's name. Oh. So. <laughs> um, it's hard to keep a good man down, uh, so ignoring a good man and going yeah. to Bill Clinton, um, could you look at how indefatigable this fellow oh, really absolutely. is? I mean, the, the woman mentioned, um, and I'm not going to call any authors, this is your day, but there's another book that notes Mrs. Clinton's very serious consideration in running in 2004 if she had 
John Edwards' problems would probably not be what they are today. But uh, could you sort of look at the influence of Bill Clinton and how he's just, there's no stake or silver bullet that's just going to keep this guy down in, in any campaign? Totally, yes. Um, so I'll do Joe Lewis first. Uh, he, he was born in the South, but he came to Detroit at an early age. And uh, he, uh, one of the, one of the places in my book is the Gotham Hotel, which was destroyed early in my book by a raid by the police. It was the cultural center of Detroit. Joe Lewis would, would eat breakfast there. He'd have uh, five eggs and a steak. Um, he's, you know, the Joe Lewis fist is, is one of the two great icons of Detroit. He was Barry Gordy's hero when Barry Gordy was growing up. Barry Gordy was a boxer before he got into music. Um, Joe Lewis had an enormous influence on the African American community in Detroit. George Romney and Lyndon Baines Johnson, um, you know, Romney was talking about possibly running for president in 64. It didn't last very long because he promised that he would uh, not do that. And the Detroit News newspaper, a conservative Republican organ of, of Michigan, uh, called him on that and really took him out, and that ended those chances. Um, he was a moderate Republican. Who knows uh, what he would be today or whether he could exist in that realm. The party has changed so much. But there was, he and, he and uh, Lyndon Johnson couldn't have been more different in so many different ways. Um, and your third question, yeah, Bill Clinton, the, the threat, the theme of my Bill Clinton book is what you described. It's a constant cycle of loss and recovery. When he was on top, when he, when he was on, t well, when he was down, I always knew he would find his way back. When he was on top, I knew he'd somehow get in trouble again. <laughs> and I, this book came out before Monica Lewinsky, before all of that, but that's the central theme of the book. And he is the ultimate survivor. And I often compare him with Barack Obama, uh, these two uh, very smart, intelligent uh, uh, men who came out of nowhere, Southwest Arkansas and Hawaii, came out of dysfunctional families, without fathers, with alcoholic stepfathers, and dealt with it in completely opposite ways. Barack Obama spent eight years of his life trying to figure himself out. In, philosophically, intellectually, um, racially, all of these different ways. He went inside himself to try to figure that all out. and came out of it what I would call a quote unquote integrated personality, which helped him get to the White House and then got him in trouble in the White House because this was not a quote unquote integrated personality country. And uh, so, you know, he was in a different place than the Congress and everything else. Bill Clinton, exact opposite. He never stopped to figure himself out. He just kept plowing along. Nothing could stop him. You know, it was that cycle of loss and recovery. He became the ultimate survivor that got him to the White House and got him in trouble in the White House and out of trouble in the White House and into trouble in the White House and out of trouble when he was leaving the White House and into trouble afterwards. But it just keeps going. He is indefatigable. You know, I was starting to write about Bill Clinton right when the Jennifer Flowers story was breaking. and. People were predicting that his campaign was dead. And I said, no, you don't understand this human being. It, he will keep going. Nothing can stop him. Then a couple you know, years later, the Lewinsky scandal breaks. And you know, TV is announcing that you know, he'll, be, he'll have to resign in humiliation like Nixon. And I went on TV and said they'd have to cut off both arms and both legs and drag him out of the White House. And still, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> so yeah, that's Clinton. Hi, talk about indefatigability. What about- Good for you for saying it. I... Right, and congratulations on all your work. It's, it's really mesmerizing. The um, Renaissance of Detroit, there are yes. interesting inklings. Um, arts work is going on yes. there, reclamation of space, yep. downsizing the city. Do you have some optimism? Oh, absolutely. But as I said, I mean, I do, I really do. I, I love the people of Detroit. There's a huge spirit there. Um, you know, they've taken a lot of hits, enormous hits. Um, a lot of people have left. Um, it's, 
the, the inequities that are apparent around the country are even more intense there. You know, the donut hole, uh, I mean, the donut around Detroit, there's a lot of wealth there. Um, but what good is it doing to the people who need it the most? Um, so, um, but as I said, you know, that the, it's a great place for young people to go. There is, there are, you know, there are people, wonderful uh, philanthropists buying thousands of homes and redoing them. And there's the urban farming. There's a lot of mm -hmm. interesting, creative things in the arts. People, you know, even moving from Brooklyn to Detroit. Um, although Detroiters hate it when they say it's the new Brooklyn. It can't be a bigger insult. You know, Brooklyn is such a cliche. Detroit is real. So, uh, but, yeah, okay, well, you're from Brooklyn. I'm from yeah. Brooklyn, too. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm not. Listen, my dad's from Brooklyn. He grew up in Coney Island. I'm cool with that. Um, but anyway, but as I said before, unless unless it lifts all of those working class people who came to Detroit and and built the munitions for the arsenal of democracy and built the cars that that this country you know uses, unless we figure out how to deal with that, you know, you can't go back into the past. You can't put the toothpaste into the tube. You can't recreate the auto industry in the same way and labor in the same way, which is being just, unfortunately, the governors of the Midwest are just, have been creaming labor, you know, the last sort of uh, attack on it. Um, you know, for some, sometimes you understand the labor oversteps, but, but nonetheless, uh, all of those factors um, have made it very difficult for a lot of, lot of people and until you deal with that, you can't have a true renaissance. <coughs> I'm supposed to wrap up, but you know, you, there's nothing after me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, C-SPAN, goodbye. I, I grew up in Detroit, and um, my, my, my grandfather was one of the Grinnell brothers. No kidding. Uh, yeah. I wish I'd found you. <laughs> Do I but, get it right? You're, yeah, you've got it right. Yeah. So, so uh, some of the conversation around the dinner table was the fact, you know, when I was a young man, that um, Detroit was very stratified and, yep. and you know both vertically and horizontally, you know, absolutely in industry and in, you know sociologically, and also very inflexible. Uh huh. And can you compare and contrast that with the Renaissance today? Um, well, there's there are people trying to deal with that. You're, you're right, first of all. And um, anyway, I'm just kind of floored that, that I, I'm upset that I didn't find you. <laughs> but uh, you know, I love the Grinnell brothers' story, and I hope I do it justice. But you're right about the stratification, you know, and that had to do largely with the with the uh, you know the Detroit Athletic Club and the the powers that be and the auto industry. You know, they built these freeways so they could just get out of town in their black limousines and not see anything in the city. Uh, there was enormous stratification. And one of, you know, I'm going to Detroit four times, five times for my book. And one of the first um, places I'm meeting with is at Wayne State with this group of, of social activists and business people who have been working together to try to deal with the, those stratification problems. So I'll know more once I talk to all them, because that's not really what my, where my book is. But I know that that's a problem. I know that people are really seriously trying to deal with that, understanding that they can't have a facade of a renaissance that has to try to be a real one. Thank you for coming here, first of all. Uh, I've got two questions. One, do you talk about Jimmy Hoffa at all uh, within, <laughs> you know, within this particular book? And second, I'm reminded of uh, President Kennedy's uh, comment when he uh, spoke at the University of Michigan. Where oh, yeah, where the he, Peace Corps. Where, where, and, but he also said, uh, I'm happy to be at the Cambridge of the Midwest. <laughs> My parents went to Michigan. I went to Wisconsin. So, I, I, you know, <laughs> one's Cambridge, the other's uh, Oxford. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just kind of curious if, if, if the University yes. of Michigan has an impact in your book. As Definitely, well. yes. Uh, I, I talk about Kennedy coming to Michigan. And, you know, he arrives at late at night. and. And there are 10,000 students there waiting for him. And he really, that, so many things, I mean, ask not what you can do is in Detroit. 
the Peace Corps really sort of bloomed in Michigan at the university. Late at night, Kennedy talking to these students and saying, you know, how many of you are going to want to go out into the world and, and bring, you know, work for peace, you know, and it's sort of, so that inspiration is part of that in Detroit and the University of Michigan um, is very connected to Detroit. You know, I wish that it could have done more to help it, but, but that's definitely there. And Jimmy Hoffa? Jimmy Hoffa, uh, you can write so many books about Jimmy Hoffa. He's mentioned in the book, but I chose different mobsters to write about. <laughs> the Giacalone brothers, because they're more fun. Hoffa, by the way, is in Tennessee during this whole period under, you know, on trial. Um, but the Giacalone brothers are mobbing up the Detroit Lions, and that's fun to write about. Alex Karras and Wayne Walker and all these guys are riding around Detroit in what they called the party bus. There's an old Detroit streetcar bus that the Giacalones, the, the, the mobsters had, who ran the numbers in Detroit, had bought and transformed into this floating bar They'd go into strip joints and pick up all the, the strippers and hookers and the lions and drive around town all night. And that, the connection to Giacalone is why Alex Karras was suspended for a year and some of the other lions. So that was just, that was happening then, more fun to write about. Hoffa's mentioned, but not quite as much. Thank you. Although Giacalone was one of the two guys who uh, Hoffa was going to meet when he disappeared. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, am I being kicked out? I mean, am I cool? Yeah, OK. I have a follow-up question on the question of uh, the renaissance of Detroit. Yes, sir. Uh, Detroit was once the poster child of inner city decay and the related flourishing of suburbia. But now it seems this is sort of reversal of the trend, and a lot of pe uh, people are moving back into yes. the inner city, except there's a, lo a large degree of dissatisfaction with what's happening in terms of the gentrification. Yep. And the people who are moving in are forcing out the long-time residents of the city. Is that yes. what is going to happen in Detroit as well? Well, it's happening in Washington, D.C. Yes. I, I'm, it's I, happening all over the country. Yes, but... You know, for uh, some ways better and some ways worse. And it depends on who's the one that's feeling it. Um, certainly... Uh, downtown Detroit, but the difference is a lot of those places were totally abandoned. They were empty. There weren't people being pushed out. Um, but they can't be ignored, the people who are still there. So that's, that's the difference. Uh, you know, there's a glorification of the Renaissance, but I, I try to keep my eye on everything else that's going on as well that still needs to be dealt with. But I think, you know, just as the dilemmas and problems of Detroit we're only an exaggeration of all American cities. Same true of what you were just talking about. You know, I mean, think about what's happened to Washington, D.C. and the ramifications for better and worse and who's, who suffers and who wins. It's always a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.